And uh, Emily has a bit of a reflection and some music to share. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, it's nice to see your faces and um, be with you. Um, I'm actually in Chicago right now. Uh, I thought I'd start out my reflection with this joke that I think all of you taught me someone did uh but the joke is something about how uh unitarian universalists are terrible at hymn singing because they're caught up reading the next line in the verse to see whether or not they agree with it i think you know that one um well let's stick a pin in that we'll come back to it um most of you listening this morning also know that i grew up at duc and I was often singing with you or either in the choir or with uh, my dad for a special song. And when I got a job as youth coordinator at the church I attend now in Urbana, Illinois, uh, when I started singing songs for them on Sunday mornings, I thought I could get used to this. And now I'm pursuing music ministry in seminary. I remember the first song they asked me to sing at the church in Urbana. It was uh, Waterfall by uh, Chris Williamson. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play just a little clip for you in the background while I, so you can hear what it was like. The first th song they asked me to sing was this Waterfall song. And I have a vivid memory of this morning. I was a little nervous, a little short of breath. I really wanted to impress these couple hundred folks who had yet to ever hear me sing. And performance anxiety is tough on a singer. The sweaty palms isn't too big a deal, but the elevated heart rate, the tight throat and chest, it's a real bummer. When the only thing you need thing is a full pack of oxygen and flexible vocal cords. But this particular song they asked me to sing starts out slow. And it gave me a chance to catch my breath. Having been a performer and a singer most of my life, this is what I love about singing. If I'm feeling performance anxiety, I know all I have to do is open my mouth. As soon as I start singing, my body takes care of the rest. It's all the noise and static in my brain that makes me anxious before I begin. But when I use my breath to make a note, and then another specific note to follow, and I begin to exhale a melody, the chaos in my brain fades away, and I'm brought back to the present moment. Feel connected to the ground below, feeling the vibrations in the room, focusing on the twists and turns in the melody. And I'm required to slow down my breathing. As I commit to each exhale to a full phrase, I'm lifted by the air around me. With each following inhale, the posture of scarcity that worried my mind before, the song is in two of us. We'll just listen to the chorus here. Truth be told, it doesn't always work just like that, but it often does. It did that Sunday morning they first asked me to sing. I started singing, caught my breath, and the song picked up. I started to notice the beauty of the moment. My anxiety faded away. The sanctuary in this old-fashioned church has those high vaulted ceilings and a dozen floral stained glass windows. The spring light was beaming on the pews. I was sharing air with the people I love, and I was put at ease by the music. After growing up you you and now working for the church full-time i'm beginning to realize the significance of that joke 
about reading ahead in the hymn. It is indicative of a larger pattern in our faith tradition that has historically valued intellectualism and discourse over embodied practice. And without an embodied practice, our intellectual pursuits exacerbate an already anxious and uncertain world. I believe this shift to value embodiment has already begun. And I want to be a part of this change through music. This morning, I'd like to share some songs and reflections inspired my, by my first year in seminary, and namely my study of UU theologies. We spent a small amount of time studying the early antecedents of both Unitarianism and Universalism, respectively, but then we quickly moved into more contemporary thought. I was honestly surprised in this class that current progressive theological discussions in many seminaries is not how long is God's beard and how many strings can he pull at the same time, but instead there are great many theologians that describe theology as our ultimate concern and use the word God as a symbol for what is most important to us. I came to learn one practices theology in conversation with people and theologians from the past. And this practice of calling in the past to illuminate the present is why when I told my professor I wanted to write hymns in place of a final paper, I thought I'd try a style of hymn writing, which is the cornerstone of the UU hymnal, taking old Christian tunes and rewriting the lyrics to make the songs more inclusive, often extracting Jesus and God language. I know there are a lot of mixed feelings about this as a UU hymn tradition. I know we've had this conversation at DUUC, especially around Christmas time, and I'd be glad to have that conversation again. I think we still have much work to do in the way we acknowledge our past and the music and culture we inherit, both as Americans and Unitarian Universalists. And there's also something beautiful about taking old music and making it anew. So I tried my hand at the old Methodist hymn, Blessed Assurance. Maybe some of you know it. Written in 1873, this tune is by Phoebe Knapp, and the original lyrics were written by her friend, Fanny Crosby, who was blind at the age of six. The song was published by Crosby's husband at a time when women couldn't even speak in the church. I listened to their original hymn and I tried to put myself in their shoes. Crosby writes with a deep conviction. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. While I don't have a personal Jesus, I crave a pastoral something to guide me through life's challenges. And for me, that is knowing that I'm a part of a great web of life. A chain reaction in the cosmos. This chain reaction is ever evolving and by the many links in this great web, I am changed and by my choices and with my agency, I am changing it too. I am pleased to share with you now my new words for blessed assurance, new hymn called Nature's Way.
There's a, we're going to light the chalice. Uh, we can do our standard um, chalice lighting, which I will put the words in the chat. And you can read along with me. Can you hear me all right with my headphones? All right. Um, may the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal with love to help with compassion, to bless with joy, to serve you spirit of freedom in the fullness of community. We have, um, Emily has got another reflection and I will turn it back over to her and she's uh, gonna have Thanks, another Dad. music uh, video to show. Yeah. Yeah, we got two more songs uh, today. I'll kind of got a little reflection for each. So um, my my experience in seminary, and particularly in this UU theologies class that I mentioned, has helped me to locate myself in what the Unitarian preacher Theodore Parker called the arc of the moral universe. I learned about what academics called the modern era, be beginning around the Enlightenment in the 1700s, when reason and science pushed against the church's dogma and doctrine, and science became the new gospel for many people, especially the forebears of UUism. This modernism lasted three centuries until we moved into the postmodern era which they say we still reside in today. This postmodernism is where everything is made contextual. Even science needs to be taken with a grain of salt, depending on who did the research, who funded it, what their biases were. The list goes on. The gospel of science in the modern era turned into the subjectivity in the postmodern and a reassuring truth with a capital T is nearly impossible to find. Placing myself in the arc of this history helped turn a light on for me, why I feel called to ministry. We live in such uncertain times with misinformation flying everywhere you look. 
this subjectivity makes solving big problems like catastrophic climate change and white supremacy often seem so impossible to solve. I believe we need tools to help acknowledge the harm that's been wrought on our planet and help us engage our grief in a way that we can take stock and not be debilitated by it. With this in mind, I wrote lyrics to an 1859 shape note hymn called The Dying Californian. My set of lyrics is a lament for our planet, inspired by a book we read in this class by a theologian named Michael Hogue. He wrote that dualism and the separation between God and man, mind and body, human and nature is how we created climate crisis. And only by valuing ourselves within the interconnected web of all existence will we, can we be equipped to face our responsibility on our precious planet. The original hymn for this next song began as a poem written by a New England man who died at sea trying to eventually get to California for the gold rush. The protagonist wishes farewell to his family, accepting his death in his failed attempt at manifest de destiny. I thought this original poem and him was a poignant conversation partner in the way that the dying Californian's motivation in 1850 to extract from the land led to his demise. And I wanted to carry his lament through into 2022 and write new verses to take stock in our own moment of loss and uncertainty on planet Earth. Here is my addition to the dying Californian. Hmm. 
I think we need these songs of lament and we also need songs of hope. We can't have one without the other. And while you might think, sure, we need songs of hope, we need theologies and philosophies of hope, it might seem obvious to you, but it's a pretty controversial item of discussion in my seminary and in my peer group. For some, for many of my peers, it is socially unacceptable or even morally reprehensible to be creating hope in dark places. Particularly insidious for them is creating false hope that could potentially blind us from our job demanding justice for people and our planet. But I stand in optimistic defiance to these friends and peers. I believe in creating a worldview around hope is crucial both for the present moment and for growing the potential for more good in the world, no matter how slim the odds may be. My last song I'll share this morning is a testament to this hope and my firm belief that hope does not steer us away from making justice and finding freedom, but steers us towards it. My Theo musicology is inspired by Adrienne Marie Brown, an activist, revolutionary, and writer. Her book guides us to the same idea. She claims that what we pay attention to grows and the quality of life we build around ourselves has a ripple effect into the great beyond. Before we get to this last hymn, I wanted to tell you that throughout my year in seminary, because of my work in campus ministry, my nagging question is almost always, what can religion do for us, especially for young people? What can the UU church do for my friends who are activists, social workers, teachers, who share our UU values but don't want to come to church? What can the UU church do for me? Why am I even here? And I'm here because I believe that if we are to find a way to liberate ourselves and the next generation, we need to do the work to acknowledge our past and find the tools to stay present, to stay awake to one another and the struggle for freedom. For me, music is that tool. And I want our church to prioritize an embodied somatic and sonic expression of our beliefs on Sunday morning. If we did this more and more, perhaps making the music the main event instead of a lengthy academic sermon, that could be a good start. If we focused on the power of music to engage our intellect and move beyond it, to let the music move our feet, let it well up in our eyes and help us feel our collective heart pound. If we as Unitarian Universalists engage music as medicine today, we'll stand stronger for the challenges that face us tomorrow. And with any luck, our allies would join in for the chorus. This last one is a call and response. Feel free to join in wherever you are. Here is. I am, we are, and I'll put the lyrics in the chat too.
Thank you all. Thanks for listening. I bet we have time for a discussion, don't we, Dad? Yes. Um, feel free to unmute yourself with comments or questions for Emily, and and uh, we can engage in the conversation. I I loved the songs and. Uh, Nice acoustics on the last one on the under the bridge or bridge. whatever. <laughs> Emily, thank you very much for that um, presentation. It was really, really good. And um, you're going to be a fantastic minister, I think. <laughs> um, one of the things I thought about as you were speaking is uh, hope. How do you, how to hope when uh, it does kind of seem like you're it's just foolish or something to think mm -hmm. it, you know really um devastating can can be fixed so there's a family situation going on now with one of my brothers and he's coming out of rehab pretty pretty soon and, and he's not everything is not in order and so my my siblings are are ho feeling hopeless and um i i have to keep that i feeling that he's going to make it, he's going to make it going for myself and for him as I talk to him. So I thought of that in a personal way as you were talking about hope and uh, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. I also, I like your view on hope. I figure if you don't have hope, then why bother even trying? That's, that's why you try because you have hope that what you do might work my help so kudos <laughs> <laughs> thanks deb yeah i'm with you there emily when you're talking about the importance of music it i was reminded of how impactful song and music was during vietnam i mean you're you're too young to <laughs> It's ancient history for you, probably, but um, she heard a lot of it, though. Believe me, <laughs> it's <the> true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it it made a huge difference. It it created a movement, um, and I I think that's one thing that I've been concerned about lately is that the music has been lacking. And I think it's extremely important. Yeah, one one thing that really um, stuck out to me in this book that we read about climate change was the difference, or in in discussions I've had with friends and 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 people of all ages, that um, that the difference between the um, when you compare Vietnam to 2020 and 2022 and climate change and these kind of really charged um, times when people are out in the streets, you know, for protesting Vietnam or protesting George Floyd, um, comparing those two and, and especially for in context of climate change, before people were in, in Vietnam, people were protesting something that was like really um, present, really like close to the chest, like people weren't coming home, the brothers, people were dying. And for climate change, it's not for everybody, but for a lot of folks, especially in the US, it's, it's, it's something that is far away and we have to do this preventative work that is kind of is against our, 
our disposition where we're usually uh, we can get fired up about something that's right here and right close to the chest and so in the way that i feel like music is a tool to to wake us up it it, it is it can make us feel something a little stronger than your you know blog post whatever you yeah. know When you talk about blog posts, I think that's so interesting because um, I, I recall several years ago thinking, why this before George Floyd, um, why aren't people out in the streets? Why and mm -hmm. and it occurred to me that there's blogging and um, social communication is taking place online it, it's such a different different time um, mm -hmm. and and you're absolutely right about vietnam everybody was touched well pretty much everybody was touched by it except maybe unless you were in congress or very very rich <laughs> you managed to get daddy's intervention but um yeah and and climate change is something that it's easy to twist twist what's happening in that we've always the climate's always gone through different cycles and there's so many ways of redirecting the importance of it. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm reading a book by uh, William Kent Kruger called This Tender Land. Mm -hmm. It starts out with this child who's uh, a white boy who's living in a, what he calls an, an Indian school. And the cruelty is, is just un, almost unbearable to read, but he has a harmonica. <clears throat> and that harmonica is used as a weapon against him to hurt him and to crush his spirit. But he, when he plays his harmonica, in, in, as he, he's in like this uh, you know, um, isolation room, <clears throat> then everything comes alive for him. And in the story, this woman who runs a school, who is a, a damaged person herself and, and full of pain, she uses that harmonica against him. And in the end, he has his harmonica. And it's, it's like so, it's so um, uh, heartwarming just to think about that little instrument and his ability to play it and uh, transform it, his world. It's a really good book so far. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, um, in in Ukraine, mm -hmm. have you seen some of this, the the songs? And they have a, they have their national anthem, and they have another one, and uh, there have been a f several renditions of them, and it's keeping those people together and strong, and um, it, it definitely needed wish we could have well those like what happened in what we we're talking about in vietnam bringing people together as a, a larger community of of very different people yeah. we need some new anthems yeah i agree oh ours is horrible what <laughs> what anthem oh the, the american yes oh, yeah Oh, it's disgusting. Oh, I like it. Okay, but <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't mean anything. People don't even know it's you know the War of eighteen twelve or whatever it is. It just they don't. And um, yeah, I mean the French national anthem is a beautiful, 
melody, but boy, it's bloody too. Mm. Well, the second verse of, of our national anthem is disgusting. Oh. Because it talks, <laughs> everybody knows it. I, so you know, it America, America the Beautiful has some really wonderful lyrics if you get to subsequent um, mm -hmm. uh, verses about how lo law is what rules this land or you know it's a land of laws not people <laughs> but we need a climate anthem many climate anthems and yeah and community anthems and mm -hmm. there's a project for you emily yeah yeah I hope, yeah <laughs> I, I hope i can rise to the challenge but in this in this way that my um the social justice warriors in my life I feel like there's, it's like, it takes a real craft to inspire hope and, and make, make songs that make songs that they want to participate in that are like, uh, not, not cheesy, you know, like that, like Vietnam, you know, had its Peter, Paul and Mary or what, Pete Seeger or whatever. And like, bringing if i bring my guitar to a you know a protest or a rally and be like come on everybody let's sing like it's not it's like i, I think it really takes like some some creativity it to like soften the hardened isolation of this generation and to be able to to um engage that and and try and make some some music in a cathartic way and i'm just still trying to figure out how to do that yeah there are, you, the, the, sorry check <laughs> i'm go just ahead, wondering yeah. if, if you've seen the justice choir songbook because there's a lot of oh, good yeah. stuff in there yeah and that's mm -hmm. that's started here in the twin cities i'm pretty sure Absolutely. i started putting that together and that's it's got a lot of good simple music that people could learn quickly and and join in on which is nice yeah and there are there are certain examples of good protest songs or issue oriented songs that kind of go viral but in a very narrow niche market of people you know um was it uh claudia schmidt's sometime uh collaborators sally sally rod no what's her name anyway yeah. Sally Rogers. She has they. She has a song, uh, anti gun violence song, that's really good. But it doesn't, you know, it it doesn't get out to a wider market. So I, yeah, that's the challenge, you know. We have too many issues to focus on that we're fragmented rather than one one Vietnam to focus on. We have many issues right yeah so many true can i ask you a question it's not a moral question <laughs> it's a curiosity question yeah <laughs> um i'm intr intrigued by um music ministry is that an actual something that they're teaching at your seminary or is this kind of choose your <laughs> choose your <laughs> program or make yeah it's program. it's i'm i'm trying to design my my degree around it and get a master of divinity and then a master of arts as well um and uh yeah it should it seems it seems promising that i can um kind of do my own um design my own capstone around sacred music and social movements that's the hope they're accepting of that oh they are <laughs> yeah um i haven't i haven't uh you know tied all the loose ends for that it, it would be the lot my final year which is four years away <laughs> and large large churches have professional uu ministers of music mm -hmm. totally um yeah yeah that's that's kind of where i discovered it and i went to a uu music ministry conference mm -hmm. um of 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 these folks um not so a couple of years ago and that that's kind of 
That's where I'd like to go. Since since the seminary isn't specifically Unitarian, I think what they're just two Unitarian seminaries in the country. Right. Um, it I, you must be being exposed to other facets of religion that you wouldn't have been probably if you'd gone to Star King or what is the other one? Harvard, I think maybe. Meadville, Meadville, no. Meadville, Meadville Chicago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I like it. I like getting out of uh, uh, my little bubble and get being exposed and having to hold my own in, in the face of, of, you know, other maybe conflicting ideas or just different ideas. Um, yeah. I really, I really like it. And there's a strong cohort. It's actually, they say, which I don't know if this is uh, true to my experience, but they say that half the student body is UU at United. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. I, the curriculum is not half UU, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the people, I, there's plenty of really wonderful people to be in conversation with. So, um, I think it hurts to have, especially being raised as a Unitarian, um, being exposed to other religions. I'm just appalled at my kids know absolutely <laughs> nothing. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. I really, I didn't know anything. I, I still <laughs> know so little. So, and 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 it seems to me that um, a lot of our UU ministers are chaplains, which means they deal with um a lot of different things shelly who right. was here last week and, and 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 shelly's service last week was so um interesting because i'm sure being a uu but also her experience being a chaplain and dealing with people with so many different perspectives on their personal religion so and, and how to honor them yeah mm -hmm. totally yeah mom mom and dad were telling me a little bit about that yeah and what's really interesting is it gives her it gives her such a great perspective of what it means to her and to be a uu because all she sees you know in in the people around her and their different in the diversity of, of faith um Mm -hmm. on, a, on a different note, I'd like to recognize and welcome uh, Emily's friend and colleague, Ron, from uh, Channing Murray Foundation in, in Urbana. Welcome. We're glad you could make it. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming, Ron. Yeah, for sure, Emily. Ron and I work at the, uh, for those of you who don't know, Channing Murray is our uh, campus ministry, UU campus ministry. So he and I are the kind of full-time staff there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, I've been in my very early study of, of kind of, of liturgy and music and different religious approaches to having music and Sunday services. Um, you know, some churches, build up the the energy towards the sermon and it's like someone talks for 20 minutes some like like a catholic service is going to build up the energy towards communion and it's this embodied ritual of getting up and walking around and i think the differing um patterns and structures of church services are really interesting um yeah. yeah and as you gain wisdom on that let us know we can we can uh incorporate maybe, it <laughs> yeah we we can shake things up a bit in our own little group there you go well you already are with uh i feel like your your zoom service uh, structure is really lovely yes yeah, so it's like with my chorus um that had to deal with covid and do online rehearsals it's amazing what you can come up with creatively with with the technology that's available and with the limitations of a pandemic or whatever you know 
Mm-hmm. Well, maybe now would be a good time to do a, a benediction. I have one ready, if if you like, um, and then we can uh, get to our coffee hour, or if people have to scoot away to uh, go to Mother's Day festivities or whatnot, you know, feel free to do that. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, these are closing words from Wayne B. Amason. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. The stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there's another truth. You are not alone. Blessed be and may it be so.